the Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Welcome back in to Off The Ball. It is time for us to have a look at the Sunday Papers. They're dominated by three topics generally today. Uh, quite a lot of coverage around the rugby with the Lions beaten heavily uh, by the world champion South Africa to square the series yesterday. It is now one game apiece. We had live coverage with Brian O'Driscoll and with Neil Tracy here on Off The Ball with thanks to Vodafone yesterday but crushed on the front of the Sunday Times the Springboks outclassed the Lions in the second half to set up a series decider but quite a bit of the writing around the rugby as a matter of how poor that second test was two hours of an arm wrestle uh, between South Africa and the Lions in what proved to be a kick fest in the end it was the Lions pack which probably cost them the game Uh, South Africa were back to their best as they were in the 2019 World Cup final where they were just dominating at the breakdown they kicked very cleverly during the game and they kept the tourists entirely scoreless for the second half. So Warren Gatland's side now have plenty of things to ponder ahead of the final and deciding test, which is next Saturday, live here on Off the Ball, including Stephen Jones in the aforementioned Sunday Times today, uh, claiming that potentially this should make a switch at out half with Dan Bigger maybe swapping out for Finn Russell. Also plenty of question marks about the Lions back three after they were beaten airily yesterday. On the Sunday Independent today, um, the Dacia Waterford uh, taking pride of place in terms of the picture on the front after they scored 40 points against Tipperary, the first team to ever do so, uh, to knock the Premier out of the All-Ireland Championship. Second year in a row that Tip have gone out in the quarterfinals. Potentially, it could be the end of Liam Sheedy as Tipperary manager. There's a lot of talk in the papers as well today about Joe Canning, who exits stage left on Wednesday after giving, as Michael Foley says in today's uh, Sunday Times, the last fake hand pass on the way out when he spoke to us on OTB AM and said he was going to take time about his decision uh, to see what he was going to do and then about an hour and a half later he confirmed at a sponsor media event that he had retired from inter-county hurling after becoming the top scorer of all time Uh, there's pieces about Canning throughout all of the papers today also Brendan Fanning talking in the Sunday Independent today about Gatlin being out to avoid a war of words ahead of that decider uh, with South Africa after Razi Erasmus's comments social media and elsewhere over the last week and inside uh, the Sunday Independent itself plenty of coverage of the Irish rowers which has been dominant across the papers 10th gold medal won by Ireland this week by Fintan McCarthy and by Paula Donovan it is the back page of the Sunday Independent today Eamon Sweeney's piece a river runs through it looking at the tradition now that there is in Skibbereen in the rowing club for producing rowing excellence and across a lot of the papers uh, they're writing about the graft and indeed the brain that's been put in with the hard work uh, to ensure that Irish rowing has become uh, one of the best rowing programmes in the entire world Great Britain investing 27 million pounds and this time around not getting themselves a medal and Paula Donovan in some of the papers today even being compared to Sir Steve Redgrave who went to five Olympics and uh, Paula Donovan very well placed silver with his brother Gary back in 2016 with McCarthy this time around he's won gold and with his age profile there's a feeling that he could go to multiple Olympics and win medals each time round a world and European champion in between the games too back page of the Mail on Sunday is uh, talking in the very top banner about the idea that medals aren't everything when it comes to the Olympics it's a theme across some of the papers Carl Denny has been writing about it today in the Sunday Independent too and there's a piece um, with Oliver Holt inside the paper in the Daily Mail uh, talking about Simone Biles particularly this week and stepping away from quite a few of the gymnastics final Uh, she says she's suffering from the twist It's a psychological issue that she has had. Didn't feel comfortable competing in events, particularly where it's quite dangerous if you have a fall along the way. And she's been talking about how she's not enjoyed these Olympics. Went in very much as the poster girl for the Games, particularly in the USA, where she featured all over their Olympics coverage. And the feeling was she was just going to naturally go and add multiple medals to the four Olympic goals that she's already won. And she says it's not been fun uh, being at Tokyo for her again yesterday pulling out of two other individual finals but also we'll talk about the fact that for many Olympians who go they don't quite realise the dream of winning a medal but it doesn't denigrate their achievement of going to an Olympics itself uh, also inside the uh, Daily Mail today you've got former Pertumna coach Michael Dignan uh, writing about Joe Canning and he thinks that this might not be the end of Canning he thinks we could well see Joe Canning uh, come out of retirement and go for another chance Water Win is uh, being used in a double way on the back of the Sunday World today in terms of water 
Waterford's victory and also the wins for the medals for the Irish rowing team over the last few days. And also quite a few of the tabloids today are talking about Jack Grealish potentially becoming the fifth most expensive footballer of all time. It seems at this stage he is now set for a £100 million move to Manchester City this week. And in the sun, they've also got pictures of Jack Grealish at the airport, supposedly on his way to Manchester uh, to complete that deal. That is their picture exclusive on the background of Grealish flies in ahead of going to Manchester uh, to complete that move for £100 million. And David Walsh, among those writing today in the Sunday Times about the idea that Manchester City are making the right decision in going for Jack Grealish first as opposed to putting in the big money for Harry Kane. It's something that was spoken about uh, during the week by John Giles here on Off the Ball. He reckoned that if they're going to go in big with the money, go for Harry Kane because if they try and sign Grealish first for 100 million Spurs are just going to push up the price in terms of Harry Kane if that's going to be City's second big acquisition of this summer so that's just a bit of a flavour in terms of what's on the back page it's delighted to say they were joined by Keane Tracy and by Clean O'Connor folks good afternoon to you hey Will hey Clean hi hi guys how are you Kleena, I might kick off with yourself. I mean, there's fantastic coverage across the rowing from this weekend, particularly Apollo Donovan and Fintan McCarthy, but also the women's four boat as well, who won a bronze medal uh, last week. Just a selection of some of the writing about it. Uh, Roy Curtis in the Sunday World, rowers are the pride of Ireland. Irish duo won in body, mind and heart. He says McCarthy and O'Donovan are a powerful choreography propelling their nautical chariot all the way down the aqueous highway. Um, that's a very uh, colourful uh, use of language by Roy Curtis, but uh, there's a lot of pieces across the uh, newspapers today, Kleena, particularly about McCarthy and O'Donovan's success in the boat. Yeah, it's pretty much in, a, in every paper this morning, and, and rightly so. There's a lot of interesting aspects, I think, to Irish rowing at the minute. Not only the two lads and their, their super achievement, um, we see a couple of articles about the the training culture what happens between uh between rio and now and, and all the changes and and all the things the rowers have had to deal with so we, we have an example of i suppose the lightweight culture led by dominic casey and how that has gone from strength to strength and there's a lovely piece eamon sweeney on the the back of the sunday indo just about the skib club and the culture and the tradition that's in there and and i think it's 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 an example of there's a book, it's called Goldmine, I can't remember the author, but it's about um, kind of different little sporting enclaves around the world, that very small areas where all of a sudden this this great sporting culture comes out of it. Maybe Skib is, or Skib Rowing Club is an example of that for, for rowing on an international stage because it seems that there just seems to be this super attitude and culture of, of hard work and belief and honesty down there which permeates or has started to permeate through all Irish rowing. Um, and it's like the, there's like some really re- really interesting pieces about it and and uh there's there's a bit in in Eamon Sweeney's piece about how how the lads won their won their gold medal and that they've kind of showed people that it doesn't require you to suppress your individuality to be a top quality athlete and I think that has come through with all the rowers and we saw the the women's heavyweight crew again just being delighted with their performance um in this Olympics and delighted with their medal and they've all shown a real confidence in themselves. Emer Lamb talked about her call. They usually make a push at 500 metres. She made a call at 750 because she was able to, under great physical strain, realise where they were in the race and they needed to push early. The lads were obviously under great pressure from the Germans and there's a there's a couple of pieces that describe their race and uh, Tommy Conlon's one in the, in the Indo as well describes their race very well and just the confidence in their own ability I think it was really shining through in, in all aspects around the, the rowing culture Yeah because clearly that's one of the things I noticed on the interview that we had because everyone's expecting kind of killer lines to come out of Paul O'Donovan when he yeah. stands up in front of the media to speak and he did a run of interviews between Thursday and Friday after they won their gold medal and one thing that I found quite interesting, he was saying, look, we know that we're the best boat here, so we have no reason to feel that we're actually chasing anyone else. And he said he felt that when they got to about a thousand metres into the race, knew that they were going to have to have a strong finish, that they had banked up the experience over the last couple of years between world championships and between the Europeans, that they had every reason to feel confident that they'd be able to pit the German crew at the end. He said that they didn't really feel the weight of expectation that all of us here at home were thinking they were going to go on gold medal. That's probably a big part of their success too. They seem like they're the calmest guys around. 
Well, road is kind of black and white in many ways. I mean, you have your off water training on your rowing machine, your erg, and, and everything is down to the, the millisecond, you know, and then so to earn the right to be a, an international rower, you obviously have to have an unbelievable level of fitness. And then you get into the boat and you could be great off the water, but maybe the pairing in the boat, some of them go well, some of them don't. And they've we there's been examples of people being switched in and out of that uh, men's double and the, and the four, four as well. Um, so, like, you know in your boat, is this a fast boat or isn't it? And with the way a rowing race goes, you you have your plan. This is this is the rate that we need to take. This is how we start. This is what we do in the middle to get our boat going as fast as possible. And but it takes unbelievable composure if you get off the start and the people beside you start faster, and all of a sudden they're up and you to maintain your composure and say, no, this is our plan. We know how to get our boat from A to B in the fastest way possible, and we'll stick to that. And and that requires unbelievable composure in an Olympic final in any race, never mind something like an Olympic final. Uh, Keen, something that's very strong across all the papers uh, today as well when it comes to this success is the amount of hard work that goes in. Um, there's some great pieces here, like Neil Reardon has looked at uh, particularly the amount of brain power that's been brought in. Antonio Maragiovanni and Giuseppe De Vita were brought in by the Irish Rowing Programme where things weren't so rosy back in 2004 when they went to Athens. Only one boat got to a final. For the best part, it was Irish uh, rowing teams going to B finals as opposed to competing at the very top. And then across a lot of the stories today, including uh, Shane McGrath's piece in the uh, Mail on Sunday too, just talking about the gruelling regime that these rowers have been going through to make sure that they've been in peak condition going to Tokyo as well. Yeah, I, I think that's the thing about the Olympics. I mean, you get to see like all these different events, which most of us don't see from one end of the year to the other. And you can see like how clearly every event is so, so tough. But what we don't see is the work that goes on behind the scenes. And you're right, I think Dennis Walsh's piece in the Sunday Times uh, touches on on that as well. Inside the Metal Factory is the headline on it. And like what these athletes put themselves through is, is phenomenal. And I know we'll get on to talk about Simone Biles, but it kind of feeds into that, that we we have no idea the pressure that they're under. Like so many of the Irish athletes are trying to juggle their studies, their jobs, everything else outside of trying to make it to the Olympics. And I think you're right. I mean, I, like it's a few days on and I'm still blown away by what the rowers have achieved, the, the men and the women. And, you know, you're right about the, the Irish attitude in terms of Paul O'Donovan. And that's something that's really struck me. And you can't but be impressed by it because there's a fine line, I, I guess, between confidence and arrogance. And I really don't think that they're arrogant at all. They're just so sure in their ability. And I guess as Irish people, that's probably something that maybe doesn't sit comfortable with us because we prefer to be the underdogs. You know, we prefer to have this big upset. Um, like I cover rugby for a living and like Ireland have never been past the World Cup quarter final, you know, and that that's the kind of the standards that you almost get used to. And then here's two guys that rock up to an Olympic final. And like uh, Kleena was right. Like, I mean, a couple of the pieces touch on how close the race was, but I don't know. And I can't claim to be someone who watches rowing all the time, but for me, just watching them, they seemed so utterly in control of everything that they were doing. It was a masterclass in in, in delivering on your potential, I think. And you, you, well, you're right, you touched on it. Like, uh, Carl Denny has a really good piece, and it's it's a team throughout the papers of not everyone gets that, that glory moment that most of the athletes go to the Olympics. They're the ones coming back to the airport and... You know, they're not the ones that people want to talk to, but that doesn't degrade their their achievements. And I think that's why we should probably celebrate um, the rowers because like Lena touched on what's going on in West Cork is phenomenal and Skibbereen in particular. And there seems to be like a, a bit of a sporting, I don't know what you call it, like buzz or explosion down in West Cork in recent years because the rowers are getting a, like all the headlines and absolutely rightly so. But you look at someone like Phil Healy, uh, from West Cork as well, who's blazing a trail too. And even in terms of rugby, um, there's been a huge, huge um, emergence of West Cork lads. Um, you look at Finneen Witcherly, Gavin Coombs, these guys made their Ireland debuts um, just a, a few weeks ago. So it's brilliant to see. And I think, you know, they deserve all the credit they're getting down there. Kleena, might be a good time to actually touch on uh, Carl Denny's piece, which is across pages 16 and 17 of the Sunday Independent today. And the title of the piece is When Things Fall Apart. For every Olympic dream that's realised, a dozen more are disemboweled. That's the ratio that these athletes are signing up for. And you see Emmett Brennan there, who reveals during the Olympics that he had taken out loans in the credit union just to be able to travel to make his way to Tokyo. 
these games are so important for some of these athletes because it's going to decide what type of funding they're going to get over the next Olympic cycle. They're putting four years, in the case of many of these athletes, five years because of the delay to uh, go along to the games. There's a lot more at stake for these athletes when they actually go than just medals that they could potentially win. You're, you're right, and, and it's a key point. But in any high-performance sport, we're talking about... A lot of the time we forget that and we judge it on medals and we... And we I mean, that's, that's what high-performance sport is measured on in a very crude way. What we're now seeing in Irish sport, I think, is a lot more people performing when they get to the big stage. Maybe they don't win a medal, but we're starting to perform. We're, we're seeing PBs, we're seeing uh, gymnasts in finals, four by 400 metres. So there's a, we've a, bit, there's a sense now that Ireland have a team. There's a team spirit in terms of athletes going to Olympic Games. But you're right, for every medal we win, even take the rowers, for example, and Sunita and other people that didn't, that will go away from the games feeling like, oh, I didn't do as well as I should have done. But it, it takes an unbelievable amount, not only training hours, but life commitment to even get there, to even earn the right to be put yourself forward for selection. Never mind make, make the games or, or get funded or anything like that. And it, it really is a complete commitment of lifestyle and they they do it because they love their sport and and they love they love performance and competing and all of that but it's it's unbelievable pressure and it's it sometimes funding hinges on one performance on one particular day and think about it we've all had bad days in work so what happens if you're if you're bad day in work i know they're not professional but mm. but it happens at an olympic semi-final or a qualifier or something like that and it is heartbreaking and we also have to remember that in order to put yourself in a position to compete, you have to make it a priority. So it has to become the most important thing. And and I, and what I do like about the Irish athletes now, that they seem to be able to keep it in perspective, but you do have to make it a, a massive priority in your life. So when it doesn't happen, when you don't get the, the result that you're chasing, it can really, you're trying to keep it in perspective, but it there's a, a huge fall off a cliff emotionally and physically and everything after that. And it's heartbreaking to watch that. And we're here watching it with, with cameras and newspapers and we're here sitting on a Sunday morning in Ireland dissecting what, what they, these people are going through. So it's, I, I find it hard to watch it for people because it's such a roller coaster. And I mean, that's one of the reasons p people play sport. And that's one of the things high performance athletes like. They like the roller coaster and the ups and downs. But for every up, there's there's a lot of downs to go with it. Yeah, because Keen, when it comes to us just watching on the couch and seeing how these athletes get on, we're all probably guilty of projecting our expectations for Team Ireland onto them, like with Sunita Pushpur particularly. You know, given the legacy she's had over the last five years with winning World Championships and with winning Europeans, and even her time was really good at the Europeans earlier this year, people thought she was going to breeze along and win a medal, and then she won her heat comfortably. Didn't happen for her in a semi final. Similarly, with Reese McLenaghan, we're very hopeful that he was going to win a medal, having been a previous European champion back in 2018, and he has a slip in one chance he gets one chance to perform in that pommel horse it doesn't happen for him this morning and he misses out on a medal it's often those kind of small margins which unlike in a lot of other sports you mentioned rugby keen where you know you get knocked out of the champions cup or you get beaten in the six nations next year you're straight back in to play that they have to wait until the next olympic cycle to come back around to get to that point again yeah it's it's so true Will. I, I, like i think there's an element of a lot of people have maybe unrealistic expectations of, you know, our sporting stars. And that is that it that applies across the board. I mean, you know, it, you mentioned rugby there. Like if you look at the sevens, lads, I mean, I saw like a lot of online criticism because they finished, what was it, 10th in the, in the end. But people don't realize that Ireland's sevens program is only a few years old and it's not really a level playing field when you're going, you're taking on even countries like Kenya who, who ended up beating them in that playoff. I mean, they've had a sevens program for, for far, far longer. So I think people, people don't see, like I said, a lot of these sports from, from one end of the year to the, to the other. And then all of a sudden when the Olympics comes around and, you know, athletes aren't making semifinals or they're crashing out in their heats. There's like this kind of, well, like, why is that happening? But it's not really a level playing field. And also you're talking about very, very small margins. Will, I mean, if you look at, I know there was a lot of talk today about this being, you know, a super Sunday for Ireland. And you look at the golf, Rory McIlroy lips out for, for a putt. I mean, almost, almost went in. Uh, you mentioned 
Reese McLegan there, his finger gets caught on on one of the on the, the pole or the, the pummel horse that he was doing, like such small margin. Thomas Barr just uh, recently there hit a hurdle in his um, in his run, and then Aidan Walsh injures his ankle um, in like celebrating. I know he comes away with a medal still, but. There's such small margins at the very, very highest level and that applies across the board. But for me, I think people have to have more realistic expectations that the the people we're seeing on our TVs are people at the end of the day and there's people behind this. They have the same issues that everyone has. And I I guess that's why I was so impressed with Simone Biles this week. I was just kind of, you know, not baffled because social media can be assessed it at the best of times but I just couldn't understand the criticism that she was getting I think if anything she is like a trailblazer in terms of obviously in terms of her sporting prowess and what she's done over the last few years but to have the guts to you know say that her mental health wasn't right and you know and another point of that that's been missed is the fact that she walked away for the good of her mental health and also for the betterment of her team. the USA gymnastics team which yeah. seems to have been lost lost in all of this as well so like I think we just have to remember that th- these people might be hugely, hugely successful and unbelievably talented at what they do, but they're people at the end of the day and they have life struggles just like everyone else. Yeah, uh, we'll talk a lot more about that after the uh, news at two o'clock. We're going to touch about the uh, lines as well. Uh, there are some other Olympic pieces which I think are well worth uh, having a look at today. Uh, Sean McGoldrick has written a good piece about Kelly Harrington uh, where she's spoken about the fact that she doesn't want this Olympics to define her are also to be defined just by boxing, talking about some of the work that she's been doing, uh, particularly with disadvantaged kids outside of the ring and how important that is to her. Kelly Harrington, again, who we've heaped a huge amount of expectation onto, is in the ring on Tuesday for her quarterfinal to hopefully uh, follow in the footsteps of Katie Taylor and medal in the women's lightweight division. There's also plenty of writing about the women's hockey team, who I think the whole country uh, fell in love with back in 2018 when, as huge underdogs, they got to the World Cup final. And Maybe it's the end for some of these players who've got to 200 and 150 caps uh, over the last few weeks at the Olympics. They were knocked out in Poule after a defeat against Great Britain. We'll talk more about the Olympics, about the Lions and about the coverage of Joe Canning when we come back after the news at two. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. The The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Welcome back to our review of the Sunday papers. A lot of coverage about the Lions against South Africa. The second test yesterday, the world champion Springboks winning by 27 points to nine to set up a series decider in Cape Town next Saturday. It will be live here on Off the Ball with thanks to Vodafone, Unite the Pride. Um, but the game, a uh, pretty dour affair, is being ripped to shreds in many of the editorials which are in the newspapers today. Brendan Fanning in the Sunday Independent saying that the series is still alive but the game is in intensive care after the kick fest uh, that we saw yesterday between the Lions and the Springboks. Was it compelling? Yes. Chess with violence has its attractions, but the staggering amount of time that was gobbled up by the moves on that chess board with endless reviews made you wonder about the value of it all, is what Brendan Fanning has said. Uh, Keen Tracy, I'll give you a first shout on this, given that you're a rugby writer as well. Has this Lions tour been enjoyable to watch? Um, enjoyable is probably a strong word, Will. I do, I do agree that it has been compelling, but yeah, like I, I don't know if we should really be surprised. I think it's what's most surprising maybe is is, if, is from a Lions point of view. I don't think anyone should be surprised about how the box are going about their business, even in terms of um, the first test. All they did yesterday was did what they did in the first test, but far, far better. So this is how they won the World Cup in 2019. Um, rugby, you know, tends to work in cycles in that, you know, whoever is in vogue or whatever style of play is in vogue, everyone else is trying to, to follow suit. And I think South Africa winning the World Cup, while it was great for them, it, it wasn't so good for, for the game of rugby because more and more teams are trying to copy this approach, which is very, very limited. It's based off a strong set piece game um, and an inordinate amount of kicks. It's tough to watch, but I think more the focus should be on the Lions because they knew exactly what was coming, yet they don't seem to be able to think outside the box. I think um, Bernard Jackman in the Sunday Independent kind of summed it up nicely. He said, um, there's no evidence, to st- there, there's been no evidence that Gregor Townsend has the keys to unlocking this box defence, so I don't think tactically they can change too much. And that is the issue. I mean, I know it wasn't obviously the easiest preparation in the, the warm-up games. They, they, the standard of opposition they were facing was, was woeful. But 
they were still looking to play the ball and once it came to the tests that kind of went out the window um, so you'd wonder like what was the point of it all but yeah it, it was a tough watch um, I mean the first half was over an hour long I mean as people were pointing out it was longer than Rassi Erasmus's um, infamous video during the week so um, it, it is a tough watch but I mean that it's not going to mean that people are, I don't think people are not going to tune into the, the third test to see who wins but yeah rugby is in a strange place I think at the moment um, it just kind of even if you look at, you know, parents, you know, there's a big issue around concussion, as we all know, and parents are kind of, you know, a lot of parents watching the game, wondering if they want their kids to get involved in it. But I think a lot of parents and even kids themselves, like if this is supposed to be the best of the best of what this sport has to offer, it's really, really not going to attract, I don't think, many new supporters, which is what you want. Like, I mean, you want to grow the game, but it's it's been tough. Yeah, I think Brendan Fanning... Um, and I summed it up, you mentioned the, at the quote about at the start, but he also says, if you were from World Rugby, you drive by and pretend it never happened. Leave aside the minor detail that tactically the game is in intensive care and focus on the stuff that can come up in court. And I think that kind of hits the nail on the head, really. Yeah, and on that point, Keen, the siding commissioner is going to be very busy over the next few days. We are chatting uh, to Neil about this a few minutes ago on the news round. There are multiple incidents that are being looked at after yesterday's game, you know, potentially a bite by Stuart Hogg, which he denies. Uh, but there was also the red card decision on Ches and Colby, which wasn't given when Conor Murray uh, clearly went face first into the ground, despite the official saying that he landed on his back. And there were loads of kind of 50-50 calls. And again, we see the Yaku Johan account tweeting overnight about some of the decisions that the Lions were given. I, I presume the officials and the siding commissioner are going to be in the spotlight for the next 24 hours. Yeah, and you know what? In in many ways, the, the build-up last week to the second test was, I mean, while it, there was, of course, an element, it was entertaining. And from, our, like, from a journalist's point of view, there was a lot in it. But when you strip it back, there was a lot of nonsense in it as well. And for me, the second test kind of fed into that. And you're right, the siding commissioner is going to be, is going to be very, very busy. But it's a slippery slippery slope for rugby to, to go down this route. I mean, every single decision is being magnified. And, and I actually think a lot of decisions yesterday um, were actually far clearer, that, like, I mean, than the ones that maybe Rassi Erasmus has been um, going on about. I think, you know, in the, in the Mail on Sunday, Alan Roland, who was obviously an Irish referee and refereed of a World Cup final. I mean, I, I picked out one line that he wrote. He said, I thought the officials handled the occasion excellently. Um, now, I would totally disagree with that. I mean, in my view, I think Rassi Erasmus, in his, his ploy of recent video, he got exactly what he wanted because I thought the referee, Ben O'Keefe, bottled a couple of the big decisions. I mean, no one wants to see a player of Chelsea and Colby his quality sent off, albeit he's he's hardly even featuring the test because the box just don't seem Kick, to want yeah. to play for his strengths. I'd say he wants to get back to Toulouse as quickly as he can to actually play a bit of rugby. But for me, the, the, the referee, Ben O'Keefe, did bottle the big decisions. I thought that was a stone wall red card. I mean, Faf de Klerk caught Conor Murray high as well. And they quickly like breezed over that incident. Even Duhan van der Merwe took uh, Peter Steff to toy out and you know didn't get punished as well. And then later got punished for the trip on Colby. So there was a lot in it. But for me, like even like referees are becoming more and more of bigger personalities in the game. And I, I just don't think that's the way to go. I mean, you have on Sky Sports, you have Nigel Owens and like he's 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 being called upon every two seconds, and I think even having a referee, and I know it's the same in football, isn't it? BT uh, often have um, Peter Walton, is it um, for for VAR decisions and things like that? And is this really the way we want to go down? Do we want to have referees this much involved? Because I mean, really and truly, we shouldn't know much about who the referees are. Whereas now they're becoming personalities, and I think that's a very very slippery slope to go down. I mean, I was hearing more of Nigel Owens um, yesterday in the second test than I was of Sam Warburton, who's there to actually provide you know incisive analysis and. That, that to me is not the is not where rugby needs to go at all. Yeah, it's it, again probably not helped by the fact there were so many referrals on decisions yesterday that Nigel Owens had to be brought in multiple times. Uh, Kleena, what did you make of Razi Erasmus this week? Because it's been a most curious uh, lead into a game. You know, given that initially it would seem that the Yaku Johan account may well be Razi Erasmus's burner account, even though he denies that and had a kind of a wry smile when he said that he was a friend of South African rugby, uh, but clearly using the same technology as. Razi 
Razi Rasmus has been using uh, in terms of getting ready for games with the video analysis. And then Razi sitting down with the camera on himself for an hour uh, to go through decisions that were being made in the first test and really annoyed Australian rugby, particularly because it's one of their referees that been under the spotlight. But Razi Rasmus will probably feel this afternoon that he was able to have some sway on the officials with his antics over the last week. It's it's an interesting one, as Keane says, like it, it is compelling for an observer, but probably not for the right reasons. You know, it's compelling because it's turned into a bit of a circus. Um, and I agree your point, Keane, about the referee and the positioning of the referee and what that now means. And I suppose with all the technology we now have around refereeing and because sport is such an massive industry now and there's so much riding on wins and losses and money and all of this stuff so we, we've now created a, a situation where we have the technology to stop games and and judge minute decisions and actions on the pitch and in some ways you can say sure isn't it brilliant that means you get it right but in in other ways you're taking are you taking the focus away from the gameplay and and just playing a game and you're 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 focusing on the referee decision and I think the other thing that's that's really interesting now, we're, there's a lot of people saying that this is a big problem for rugby and, and Keen, you're talking about this style of play and how it's not good for rugby. So there's a temptation then, do we start fiddling with the rules? What do we need to change the rules because we don't like this style and tactical approach that this particular team is taking? But do you just let it, the, the fashion or the fad play out and all of a sudden it'll come back and we'll see more running and, and, and the game will open up again or is it, it a, is it a problem that's going to stay for for a significant amount of time? We've seen it in different sports, we've seen it in GAA, we've seen it in loads of sports where some so a, a team is playing in a particular way, other teams are copying it and then we or, or the, the population of that sport decide they don't like it and all of a sudden we have to do something, referees become a bigger issue. And I, I don't know where I stand on whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And I think, I mean, we see a lot of managers and, and coaches and people doing it around games is, is creating distraction, smoke and mirrors. And maybe it's a really well calculated action earlier in the week, or maybe it's somebody who wants the limelight and, and has a big ego. Um, it, it could be a, a, a multitude of reasons, I think. Yeah, because I was thinking, Lena, you can give us a perspective an ex, as an ex-player on this, but sometimes when it comes to sports, when a team becomes dominant or, say, a certain type of cynicism within play, there's a feeling that the rules have to adapt in order to cut it out. I'm thinking of the changing of the rule around the black card in Gaelic games and particularly the outcry from the hurling community uh, when the cards came in for cynical fouls that might deny a goal-scoring opportunity, the advance mark coming in in Gaelic football, which has led to a little bit of stop-start in terms of the way that attacks are now led in games. And in rugby, similarly, there's a feeling in some of the writing today, looking at Lawrence Delalio, where he said, look, when it comes to South Africa, the Lions are just going to have to think their way tactically around the issues that they have against South Africa here. Sometimes an intervention comes in, Kleena, it can damage a game in ways that it's not intended in terms of the consequences by the rule makers who are trying to change things. Uh, I, I agree. And I think the, the, the tinkering with rules has to be something that is done with really hard evidence to back it up. And and it's it's always done out of a place of, of good intent, I think, because you want a, 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 whatever, a high quality game or a high quality sport, both for the players on the pitch and as a, spec, as a, and as a spectacle and entertainment piece. Um, but rule changes can have unimagined un, uh, consequences. And also all rule changes bring massive um, spotlight on referees and I think that has to be taken into consideration as well in terms of how involved are referees in, in these decisions making if you're changing rules how how can they be implemented it's very easy to to sit back with a piece of paper or a whiteboard and decide this is if we implemented this rule it would it would encourage players to do x and therefore it would improve our game but can that be implemented in real time on the pitch is is a key question I think and and it, it is and also from a coaching perspective, everybody's going to look at different tactical things to to try and win games. And sometimes you should say, let let coaches, let, let the coaching community figure this one out. Because I think in general, in most sports, most people want a good quality game. Yeah, you do things to win when you have to. You play tactics that aren't beautiful, perhaps. But I think let coaches figure out tactics. And over, times, over time, I think everything evens out in the end. 
Yeah, because Keane, a lot's been made about how long the game was yesterday, particularly that first half, which uh, chugged along past six o'clock before it was completed. But this is becoming something in rugby now because the amount of times things are checked, the stop-start nature of the game. It's not unusual for a half to go well over 40 minutes with the amount of uh, stoppages that are actually happening. Is it damaging to the brand of rugby currently in terms of a punter sitting down to watch a game in the stands or on the TV? Oh, I don't think there's any question that it absolutely is. Because, like, I mean, it's like the Olympics. You get a lot of people who don't watch the sport regularly. It's the same with the Lions. A lot of people who don't watch rugby regularly will tune into the Lions. It happens once every four years. There's huge intrigue in it. And if you were a casual observer, you were sitting down to watch that yesterday, I'd say you'd probably have turned it off at, at half time if you even managed to get that far. And that's the reality of where it is now. I think yesterday was almost an exceptional circumstance because like I mentioned, there were so many incidents and a lot of them weren't, um, a lot of them did need to be looked at. But this is, it feeds into my earlier point of like, this is the road rugby is going down when every little thing is being microanalyzed. And rugby is like, there's so many intricacies involved in rugby. There's so many laws that it is difficult to get to get everything right. But I think, you know, it, it's 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 funny con, kind of comparing the reaction to Rassi Erasmus's video over this kind of part of the world compared to back in South Africa. Like the South Africans are loving this. Like they absolutely love it. And he he did get what he wanted, I feel like, in terms of the referee potentially being influenced, you know, because of the pressure he was under. But also in last week, no one was really talking about um how poor the Springboks were in that first test. They were able to go back, you know, just keep their heads down and work. And you saw the reaction that they got. So he took massively took the, the heat away from them. And I think in an ideal world, you know, the, the Lions will come out this or next weekend and do something different. But I just can't see can't see them can't see them actually doing it in terms of changing their tactics. I mean, Stephen Jones is writing that the time has come for for Finn Russell. I would be stunned if Finn Russell is playing in the third test next weekend. Would it be fun? Absolutely. Would he be able to change the way the Lions play? Absolutely. But you can't but really just talking... flip a switch, though, and like play in a certain way in the warm-up games, play in a certain way in the first two tests, and then put a running out half out when you've been using Dan Bigger in all the meaningful fixtures until now. Yeah, absolutely. That's the point I was going to make. And also a running out half who is liable to do absolutely anything. He's great to watch, but... You're talking about seriously high stakes next weekend. And, you know, maybe a different coach might be willing to, to roll the dice, but I would say very, very few with this stakes will 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 be willing to put Finn Russell into a game like this. But I don't think the Lions are going to have much hope, really, of winning the, the series next weekend unless they try something different. I mean, I heard yourself and Neil touching on it earlier. I mean, Dwayne from Eulen is back next week and... Like he's one of the most important players of of that Springboks Springboks pack. So you're adding another huge beef in at number eight in the position that they've actually probably struggled in over the first two tests. So that's that's really om ominous. So it was interesting. Um, you know, uh, Alan and Jones was speaking afterwards about you know um, changes that Warren Gatland might make and. For me, you know, even so soon after the final whistle, that was a real insight, I think, when the, the the captain is saying things like that into the mindset of the players. I think, you know, they're going to be sitting very uncomfortably over the next day or two because Gallen is going to have to change it up if they have any hope of winning it. And you mentioned yesterday or earlier about like the back three struggles. I didn't think Chris Harris played well. The pack needs, I think, needs to be freshened up as well. And this is probably the most frustrating aspect of it. If you look at the, the Lions squad and the quality uh, that they have at their disposal, they're capable of doing much, much more. And even, you know, I mentioned Bernard Jackman touching on Gregor Townsend. Um, like Gregor Townsend would be known as a really smart tactician, but you'd have to wonder is he being allowed to implement his um, attacking game plan? Because that is almost the complete opposite to, to Warren Ball and how Warren Gatlin has to, ha wants his teams to play. And to be fair, he's had huge success over the years with Wales and the Lions. But when you're playing South Africa, and England got sucked into this in the World Cup final, I think there's a fine balance, I think, between you know meeting that physical edge but also bringing something different. And I think the teams who don't bring something different actually get sucked into a dogfight, which is what happened to the Lions yesterday. You're rarely going to come out on top against this Springboks team because they're the ones who are slowing the ball down. They're the ones who want to drag the game on uh, and then roll off their bench, which was exceptional yesterday and probably 
I thought the Lions bench might have been looked a bit stronger in paper. So there's huge issues for the Lions, but I feel like the only way they have a hope next week is if they tweak their game plan. And the question is, will they do it? I would, I don't think they will. Yeah, when it comes to those tweaks, uh, plenty of pieces across the papers. Lawrence Salalio is saying that now South Africa have reverted to type. The Lions have no option but to try and change next week. Stuart Barnes in the Sunday Times on page three uh, saying more magic is needed from Gatland if the Lions will be able to outmaneuver Erasmus in end game. And as Keane mentioned, Stephen Jones uh, staying in his uh, article today. Uh, that's, it might be time now for Finn Russell to come in for Dan Bigger uh, to try and add something different. The only thing is, Kleena, when it comes to a group of players who travel like this after you know, three or four weeks together, they play a few warm-up games and then they play a series where there's four different nations coming together, it's very difficult in that short period of time for them to be able to implement meaningful change in such a short period. It's very difficult. Um, and- Okay, given the fact that they're all obviously professional sportsmen and and are used to this, and even from club to to national duty and and moving between different groups, they do have some uh, experience and skill set at it. But it's still also incredibly difficult to find a rhythm. And sometimes, depending on the coach, depending on what sort of uh, teams they're they're coming from, uh, that can be easier or or more difficult. And I suppose, and and Keen, you make a good point now. When you, when you're you're approaching, when you're deciding whether we stick with the same or change things up, and and South Africa, of course, they want to make it a physical battle, and the stop starting with the referee and even fed into that, and there's a there would be a natural impetus for competitive uh, to men to go right. Let's get really angry about this and and bring that physical battle and beat them at their own game and and let's chase them that way. But maybe she said it's not it's not the right thing to do because you you it's just a, a you're just going down a dead alley perhaps you know so having the bravery to say let's roll the dice change things up but as you said in in a very short period of time that has to be kept quite simplistic you you don't by the time you recover from one game and get ready for the others there has to be really clear ideas of this is how we're going to do it rather than a massive new complex game plan. N- n- the best athletes in the world can't process that amount of stuff. It, there needs to be tweaks that that bring about a change, but there isn't enough time to do an overhaul. Let's say. Yeah, I, I the, think that I think that's the sorry, Will. I think yeah. that's the, the the point of this because like lots of people, you know, will say like, oh, bring uh, Liam Williams in or bring Josh Adams, Lewis Rees, Samet, all these like you know cracking players who can really add something different, but. There's no point in bringing them in unless the game plan is tweaked to play to their strengths. And that's the big issue, I think, facing the Lions. And that's the point that Kleena is making now. It's very difficult having played the first two tests at really particular defined style to go, OK, we'll just rip up the script now and we'll start playing a little bit looser. We'll try and play to the edges when that's not been their style. And that's the biggest problem they face this week. But also, Keen, I would imagine if the Lions decide to rip up the game plan and make loads of changes for next week, notwithstanding that you know decisions upon suspensions might make an impact over the next couple of days for selection too, that probably plays right into South Africa's hands, doesn't it? Given that they've got an established system, given that they've got a fair idea of what their starting 15 is going to be, they won't mind if the tourists who haven't played together a whole lot are actually trying to make huge change. They're going to play with plan A next week anyway. Yeah, exactly. But maybe throwing something different at them mightn't be the worst thing either. Like, I mean, I think it's so frustrating the the how little game time Ty Byrne has gotten off the bench in both games. And he's just an example of a guy who has had a really, really good tour. Like, I mean, Josh Adams fits into that bracket too. What did he score? Eight tries in three games and has been nowhere to be seen in the first two tests. So I think there's a, there's a balance here between rewarding guys who've been on form because what's the point in taking them away to South Africa in this, you know, strict bubble and away from their families if they're not going to get a chance um, when it matters most. But I, I, I understand what you're saying, Will, but I think at the same time, I think if the Lions don't freshen it up and don't change it, I think if that plays right into the Springboks' hands as well because they'd, they'd love to face that same team again um, next week because they're going to do the exact same thing. And I think it, it's worth remembering as well and for anyone who's maybe not aware, like the Springboks have barely played since they won the World Cup in 2019. They had that game against Georgia um, and then they had the South Africa A game, which was a glorified Springbok selection. And that was that's the only two games they played before this Lions series. So now they've had two tests under their belts. Uh, they've Dwayne Vermeulen coming back. Um, they're really hitting their stride now and that they've huge momentum going into this, you know, their COVID issues, touch wood, seem to be behind them. They've got that match sharpness back. I think even you look at someone like Andre Pollard yesterday, who was 
pretty poor in the first test, but like he had only just recovered from COVID um, and Manpipi on the wing was the same. But those two guys were absolutely instrumental in that second half performance yesterday, which it's worth remembering as well. Like the Lions were actually winning at halftime and South Africa won the second half. was a 21-0, I think, which was emphatic. So, yeah, it's just go back to your original point. I think the Lions are going to have to freshen her up in, in certain positions just to throw different pictures at the spring box because if they don't, I think it's curtains for them. Kleena, like a lot of the articles are touching on the future of the Lions series and whether it's been diminished by what's happened in South Africa over the last month too. Like there was plenty of debate uh, before this even happened. Was it right to go to South Africa when they've been hit so hard by their winter wave with COVID-19? Uh, then the games couldn't go back to Johannesburg and they've stayed in Cape Town for all three to just try and get it completed. They're talking about how important this was financially to both South Africa and the idea of the Lions as a touring party that they got it completed, got that sponsorship money, got that TV money in, which was crucial. Have you actually warmed to this series? Have you been interested in it? Because it's in a difficult space to try and win the hearts and the mind of supporters too, because the Olympics are on, uh, you've got various different things, like say the back end of the Gaelic Games Championships on currently. It started off with the European Championships on during the warm-up games too. Have you been stirred by this series between the Lions and the Springboks? To be brutally honest, I would say it's down my list of priorities. As you mentioned, the I suppose from, from an entertainment factor, the quality of what you could watch yesterday versus the some of the Olympic activity, some of the GA activity, it, it it didn't it didn't make me go, God, I better watch that I better watch that second test. And especially when you when you turn it on and, and you see that and it's stop and start. And I think from a from a and, and to be honest as well, all, all the circus around it, for me personally, I get tired with it because I'm like, oh, here's this video from this guy and it's it's kind of waffle and like, I, I want to watch the actual sport. Um, so while it's it's talking points for people, you know, chatting to each other, did you see that, did you see, did you see Razzie's video and all that, but but as a, as a sporting person, I, I haven't been particularly enthralled by this series. I think from a COVID perspective, the questions whether it it should have gone or or, or should have been scrapped altogether. I mean, all across the world, we're, we're having the same conversation about the, the Olympics and all across the world that people are just trying to make things happen in the face of COVID. So that that's a much bigger generalization. I think everybody's trying to make things happen. Um, but a, in comparison to everything else that's happening in sport at the minute, to be honest, it w- it wouldn't be it wouldn't grab my attention, and some of the some of the negativity around it has contributed to that for sure. Uh, Keen, given you're you know a rugby fan as well as a rugby writer, is it a bit grating? Like I find it a little bit anyway. At least watching say the Sky Sports coverage where you got Squawk and Quinnell telling us that this is the greatest test in rugby and this is the most important game these players are going to play when. Like realistically, we know that quite a few players in that pitch have played in European finals. They've played in World Cups. You're straight selling the fib to yourself if you think that the Lions series is the most important thing to these players. Yeah, I guess it's probably maybe down to the individual players. You probably have to ask them. But yeah, I think you know this, the the Lions is kind of Sky Sports baby, and like they do as much as they can to to hype it up. And to be honest, yeah, it goes it goes way too far uh, above. And I think. Even, you know, their coverage has been a bit, I, I think, messy. I think there's so many people on comms in the game, even that it's hard to kind of get a feel for it. You have Will Greenwood shouting every two seconds, looking for Nige, Nige, Nige Owens to come in and, you know, give his feedback. And like I said earlier, meanwhile, Sam Warburton, who I think is one of the best analysts in the game, is struggling to get a word in. So, yeah, you're right. And I think Lena makes a good point about the Olympics being on at the moment and, for me personally, it's why I love the Olympics so much, apart from the sport itself, is actually hearing the stories of the athletes, including the Irish athletes as well, I'd have to say. Like, I mean, there's a lot of them I'm kind of only getting to know now over the last week, and it's it's absolutely brilliant. And to go back to Shane McGrath's piece, um, that's it's not all about medals. He, he makes a, a, good, a fair point, I think. He says, uh, whereas Gaelic games, rugby and soccer have become closed worlds, access mainly offered now through uh, bleached, choreographed and deathly dull media events, uh, which is inverted commas, um, an Olympic team brims with new and unheralded stories. I think that's very, very fair. I think that's part of what makes the Olympics so special. And yeah, it's probably what makes the Lions Tour, like I said earlier, if people, if, if you're a casual viewer, it's maybe not why you, you're, you're not tuning in because, I mean, you look at like the Lions starters that are the Irish Lions starters yesterday, you know, Robbie Henshaw, Connor Murray, um, Tyg Furlong and Jack Conan. I mean, I think most people at this stage know their stories. You know, they know their backgrounds. They're used to seeing them on the TV. Whereas maybe if you switched on the other channel, 
you'd see the the mixed relay team, for example, or whatever, you know, which people might not be as familiar with them. And they've got really interesting backgrounds and really interesting stories. And that's what the Lions is up against at the moment. And I think it'll be interesting last week. Um, a couple of people have actually said it to me that um, I think Limerick are playing at the same time um, as the final test last week in the hurling. And a couple of people have said to me there, and who would be big rugby fans, by the way, and they're like, mm. absolutely, we're watching the, the Limerick hurling. And like that was pretty kind of eye-opening for me too because they'd be big rugby peoples. And that's, I guess, where the Lions is at the moment. Yeah, it's a direct clash. Uh, five o'clock, the Lions uh, kick off next Saturday and uh, Crow Park for Limerick against Waterford at the same time. Miles Harrison will be back uh, on commentary. Good news for him after his uh, recent bout of illness that he'll be back for the final test. You'd feel for Conor McNamara, another Limerick man, though, who's been doing the first two games on Sky Sports. Uh, Cleaner, when it comes to the Olympics, Olympics point. I think that's an important one in terms of access to the athletes because something I've noticed just, just purely from a media point of view is that Team Ireland have been incredibly accessible and have also had a direct link to supporters because of how they've used social media in this Olympics in a different way to previously. Maybe part of that is because they're in a bubble in Tokyo and have very little to do but to uh, stay away from COVID-19 and to just compete in their events. But this time around, we have got a spotlight on many of their stories, which we wouldn't have even really had in previous Olympics. I think a lot of just supporters at home have actually got quite attached to the team by learning their story over the last couple of weeks. I think it's been one of the best bits about this Olympics. And I would love to see if it was a, um, I would love to know if it, if it was a planned approach to the whole thing, because what it also does, we, we started, uh, earlier on talking about the human nature of these athletes. So the more you know them, the more you see them as a human. We know now that the people have taken out credit union loans. We know what it means to them. We know about their their coaches, um, Reese and, and, and his coach and, and how they've they sat down six years ago and made a, a 10 year plan. And he's the first gymnast to be in a, an Olympic final. When you know all of that stuff, you're a lot more invested in the people and invested in their stories and it makes it all more meaningful. And then they've been incredibly open and honest after either big wins or defeats. And again, there's, there, there is this sense of Team Ireland now, I think, whereas before we, we only had maybe a handful of athletes and, and, and very good athletes and, and doing very well. And, and But we are... I mean, we, we talk all the time about Ireland's love for sport, but the more, we're, and we're a small country, so the more connected we feel to these people. Um, I, I live in, in North Dublin and there's posters of boxers all around and, and you, you feel like, geez, they're, they're very connected to their local community. And I think the fact that when they've been on the Olympic stage and all, the around, all around the Olympics, that connection has been, seem to be an important piece that they wanted to keep alive and and maybe because there's no spectators um there's no friends and family there that maybe for the athletes themselves that feeling of we have a whole I, I don't know what paper it was but someone described that there is nobody here but we know we have a stadium of supporters at home watching us and i i think that's that seems to be meaningful for the athletes and they understand the importance of that and i think it makes it hell of a lot more entertaining for the rest of us when we're watching and listening to them because that that enthusiasm for what they do is has uh, has come across loud and clear yeah definitely we saw even from Shane Larry this morning when he spoke after not winning a medal in the golf he said he wasn't disappointed for himself because he knows he's still got some big tournaments for the rest of the year but he was saying he was devastated for people at home because he really wanted to bring a medal back and to be able to share in that with the country and it's been a wonderful distraction the Olympics for all of us over the last couple of weeks too we're going to take a very short break when we come back we're going to be talking about the widespread coverage around the retirement of one of Hurling's modern greats Joe Canning when we return The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball Bulmers.ie The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball Just some news from Tokyo in the last few moments. An appeal has been lodged to a possible hooking of the hurdles which is dragging the trail leg lower than the hurdles height by Italy's Alessandro Sibilio in heat two of the 400 metres. That wasn't Thomas Barr's heat but as things stand, Barr is the next outside the times that qualified for the final. So if that uh, was to be a disqualification, Thomas Barr could yet be running in the Olympics uh, 400 metres hurdles final. Uh, we're taking a look at the newspapers from today. Plenty of coverage about Joe Canning. Uh, he has announced his retirement at the age of 32 after 14 years of inter-county hurling. During that period, the Pertumna hurler has become the top scorer of all time exiting the stage after breaking Henry Shefflin's record in their defeat in the weekend before last 
lost against Waterford in the qualifiers. Yesterday, this is what Kilkenny legend Taggy Fogarty had to say about Canning's legacy in the game. An absolute icon. Uh, I remember the, 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 the very game that you're talking about, 2-12 from a youngster, I think he was 18 years of age. Uh, I think he was marking Dermot Duraco Sullivan, which is a no mean feat. Um, but Joe has been, has been talked through the GEA world, you know, when you're in the club scene and stuff, you always talk about who's coming up to the ranks, Richie Hogan, maybe for us, or whatever the case may be. Joe Canning was earmarked at a 15 years of age. He was doing phenomenal things with his club, poor Tomda. And then he came on the scene with Galway, and he just couldn't associate. It was Galway... You're playing Galway and you're playing Joe Canning. And when you're known as Joe around the GEA circle, you know you've met it. When, you know, you, when, you, when you're known as, the, as one name, you know you've met it. And I've seen um, a no look flick hand pass from Austin Gleeson there today. That's a Joe Cannon um, speciality. I think that came from his technique, his um, ability to, I think, have the pressure on his shoulders for all those years. Um, because he knew himself that he didn't, if he didn't perform with Galway, more likely is Golly would have lost and he had the pressure of the scrutiny of the media being on him at a very young age um, and having to perform and that is very hard day in day out to do that and Joe has done it for 10 to 12 years um, phenomenal displays massive scores against Kilkenny I remember he he's, he caught a ball over Joey Holden and uh, one touch into the hand bang back in the net uh, just sideline cuts over the bar UL LIT you hear all the stories during the week now with managers and they're coming out with little comments about he did this and he, he did that but a phenomenal leader and very humble and that's what I like about the guy that's what I like about sports people when they when they go to the, the elite level you know, at the Henry Shefflin's, the DJ Carey's and these lads. But Joe was very humble and he struck me as a fella that probably didn't like the limelight that much. I uh, liked to kind of avoid it and do his talking on the field and I admire him for that. And um, pity he's gone, um, but look, it's his decision. Uh, I felt maybe another year or two in him. Um, but a phenomenal man, phenomenal hurler, done great things and I'm delighted, absolutely delighted he got his Ireland medal in 2017. Plenty of pieces after Wednesday's retirement, including Michael Foley in the Sunday Times today, calling him a hurling immortal after what Joe Canning achieved. A nice graphic on this side, breaking down his uh, record in terms of how all of his scores happened along the way. He also leaves as the player who scored the most ever sidelines at championship level, uh, scoring 44 across the league in championship, which is uh, just a remarkable skill that Joe Canning had throughout his career. Uh, but particularly want to just draw attention to the start of Michael Foley's uh, article because it caught all of us out here on Off the Ball on Wednesday morning. Neil Tracy and Owen Shane were sitting in this very studio they had a chat with Joe Canning on a day when he was doing a series of interviews and that no look hand pass happened in the interview too as Michael Foley describes it it was fitting in its own way that Joe Canning almost gifted the public one last dummy hand pass at the very hour of his leaving a day of sponsored media duties began with an interview on OTBAM where he pulled first time on some inquiries about retirement he said quote it's funny people want to retire you at some stage I haven't made any decisions yet and then end quote two hours later he goes out to do a series of uh, sponsor interviews and then says you know what actually I told the lads last weekend after the Waterford game in Thurless uh, that I'm finished so I'm retiring at the age of 32 so uh, Joe Canning going out uh, with some interesting headlines at the end but clean out when I look at Joe Canning I can't think of too many Irish athletes in the last decade or so who came through with so much promise in the same way as Joe Canning where he was marked out as a star because at 15 he was already a key player for his club for Tumna. He comes onto the scene at Intercounty, as Taggy mentioned, scores 212 against Cork in an All Ireland qualifier, which just hypes up even more how good 18 year old Joe Canning is. And then, despite a succession of injuries along the way, he goes on to be just the most remarkable hurler. Five All Stars, Young Hurler of the Year, Hurler of the Year, eventually gets Galway over the line in 2017 when they've been waiting since the late 80s. He's a player who came through as an absolute prodigy and then delivered on all that promise and some more. That's a key point about Joe. Um, there's there's a lot of comparisons to him and, and Henry, and a lot of people would talk about Henry's path to intercounter hurling, how he couldn't make his club team, and how it was a difficult path. And all of a sudden, you know, it's don't don't give up on the kid that's not particularly good because at the end of the day, they could turn out to be like Henry Shefflin. So there's a, that's one way it happens. The other way is is something like the Joe Canning story, which can be really really difficult for young athletes the teenagers so that many they're still kids and all of a sudden you're the next great thing can't wait till you play senior and you're going to bring in all ireland to the county and all this sort of stuff the and from a hurling county like galway he's his family are, are steeped in it you know so for him to be able to manage that 
over the course of his career to not crumble under the pressure to deal with all the injuries that's that's a massive um testament to his character i suppose and uh, and also how he just uh, the, the level of of his athleticism and his skill he's renowned for his skill level and his execution in all the pieces uh, Dermot Crow, Michael Foley and uh, Michael Dygan as well they, they all talk about moments of individual skill and brilliance everybody can remember different things that he did um, and and he's obviously a player who from a very young age went after practiced honed his skills you don't you don't you don't develop the capacity to deliver those sort of skills under pressure in all Ireland finals in, in or semi-finals or quarterfinals or whatever it is. You don't develop those skills overnight. That That's a lifelong commitment to being a hurler and to being a very skillful hurler. Yeah, I'll never forget uh, Joe Canning catching the ball over his shoulder, making half a yard of space and firing it into the far corner against Kilkenny, or particularly 2017, which created some of the best sports pictures of all time. As I think about 400 people in the photograph, which was captured in the Cusick stand, were watching to see if that shot against Tipperary was going to go over the bar or tail wide. A remarkable score which dragged his team into an All-Ireland final. Keen, what's important in terms of Joe Canning leaving the stage here too, as... Mick Foley has written about and Dennis Walls talks about it in terms of the importance that he still had uh, to his county on the way out. Like uh, Michael Foley says, he leaves Galway, quote, still vital, still relevant. Most players who retire don't get to leave in that way. They're almost told that their time is up as opposed to them making that decision. Yeah, like, I mean, we've probably touched on a similar team, you know, we're talking about the Olympics and stuff, like he's going out in his own terms and not a lot of people, you know, across any sports get to do that. I mean, I'd have to admit, I wouldn't, you know, be all over the GA in, in terms of knowing the ins and outs of what's going on. So when I heard Joe Canning had retired, I was surprised. But really, when you read, I think uh, Michael Foley has done an excellent job of um, going through like the serious injuries that he's had throughout his career. And you know, as a ca- kind of a casual observer, I would have been aware that, you know, he he had his injury problems over the years. But when you see it all put together, geez, like he had a really, really tough run of it. So it, it, it probably goes back to our point of like, we don't know what these guys are going through, you know, behind the scenes, you know, how his body is feeling, how he's feeling mentally. Um, Michael Foley has a line in here as well. Um, his parents uh, were both diagnosed with cancer that year and made successful recoveries. But the experience changed his perspective on Hurling's place in his life and you know, you've got to admire a guy like that who, you know, is listening to his body, is listening to his mind, and he's he's going out in his own terms. I think I was in, I was never good enough or lucky enough to play in Crow Park, but a few years ago, before Galway won that All Ireland in 2017, there was um there was a bit a media day where a few of us were kind of brought into Crow Park and done it like a few different skills challenges and and stuff like that. It was a bit of fun, but Joe Canning was one of the guys that were there, kind of kind of running it and. You know, even just to see him up close and like he was putting points over the bar, like from all different angles. And then a couple of years later, you know, it gave me a much better appreciation of what he did in that 2017 final. Because I mean, Kleena would would know, have a far better idea than me. But like when you're on that pitch in Crow Park and you're looking up and there was absolutely no one there um, when, when I was there running around, like just trying to solo in around a couple of cones. But to see what he did that day in 2017 just gave me a whole new appreciation of how not just how skillful that was, but like, I mean, the angle that he was at and everything. So, um, yeah, I've always had like a, a huge sort of appreciation for what, for what Joe Canning did and how good he was because as a casual viewer of the GA, like he's the kind of guy, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about, about the Lions, actually. He's the kind of guy that, you know, you want to sit down, you'd pay to go to watch live because he was just so phenomenal at what he does. And yeah, like I was surprised that, that he was retiring, but you can only admire his decision, I think. Yeah, Kleena, were you surprised by this? Because he's had a long time in the spotlight, really since you know the middle of the last decade. Even when he was coming through at club level and when he was a star minor and star under-21 player, Joe Canning was talked about for so long. And then, like Dermot Crow mentions in his piece in The Times today, Joe Canning was always expected to deliver on every big day for Galway. And thankfully, from his perspective, he got his Celtic cross in 2017 when it seemed at different times that maybe he'd be one of the best players to retire without one. Were you surprised to see him walk away at 32 or do all the dings and the bangs maybe from 2016 and being in the spotlight throughout your career eventually catch up with a player? He's been on the road a long time and it's it's hard to know what's going on when you're not in the camp. So you have the, the player's individual own performance and how they feel about where they're at physically. 
you have whatever sort of ebb and flow you're at with the squad in general then you have your personal life what maybe maybe he wants to start a business and and so, so there's a whole lot of different things that could contribute to this decision and you really don't know and and for someone of his from for his caliber I think what what has allowed him to continue for so long even with his injuries there, there was a there was examples of, of years that he, he barely trained because of his his injuries and different things. But it's the skill level is the differentiating factor. Because he's so skillful, okay, he mightn't be at prime physical condition, but because he's so skillful, he can find that yard of space to get the ball over the bar. That that has allowed him to make up for the other aspects that mightn't be going going as well for him, maybe from a physical preparation or an injury point of view. And nobody knows could could he play a couple of more years? He probably could. He probably could, you know. Uh, but nobody knows what what level of appetite or motivation he has at the minute for it. And it's it is nice to see somebody in any sport in in any GA team of any code, somebody who a great player like that deciding. Do you know what? The time is right now. For whatever reason, he knows that the time is right, and and to do it when he wants to, rather than an injury that he couldn't come back from or or maybe being slowly over the years dwindling away um, and, and not being the, the central presence. He he is retiring on his own terms, which is important. I, I personally wouldn't have seen it coming, but but you don't know unless you're you're closer to him. Yeah. Well, life, you... life goes on, I mean, doesn't it? I mean, and that's the, the thing about maybe that I was saying, but we have unrealistic expectations of our sports stars. I mean, you see it in rugby all the time. If you look at someone like CJ Stander, who retired recently, you know, and he just wants to spend time, more time with his family back home in South Africa. And even you see, I just used a rugby example again, like so many players retired in rugby, absolutely battered and bruised. And I've spoken to plenty of them over the years who their lives are actually impacted but when they retire in terms of the injuries that they've gone through. And like I said, you you look at the the injuries that Joe Canning has gone through and you just have no idea how his body is feeling. So um, he's got to be conscious of the fact that he's only, what, 32? I mean, still a very young man. The second chapter of his life, if you want to put it that way, is about to begin. And there's a lot bigger things um, in life than what goes on, you know, on a pitch at the weekend. Yeah, well, Joe Canning's injuries, as charted here, between 2016, he rips his hamstring off the bone. 2017, in his most important year, he was barely able to train in the month of July because of the fact that he was nursing a knee injury. Hurt his knee again uh, later in 2018. And James Skell, the former Galway goalkeeper and teammate of Joe Canning across uh, basically all of his career, Skell said there was very few games that Joe Canning would have played in the last 10 years where he wasn't going out in some sort of pain or nursing some type of injury. And Michael Dignan, who would have coached uh, Joe Canning with Pertumna back in 2010, uh, has also talked about the treatment that sometimes he received in games. Because he was the star man, Joe Canning was often hit both at club and county level very hard to try and take him out of fixtures or to try and soften him up during a game. But intriguing, Kleena, that to your point a few moments ago about whether he could play again, Michael Dignan has suggested in his hurling column today in the mail that potentially Joe Canning could take a bit of time out, maybe nurse up those injuries, go back playing with his club. And given that he probably has a still few, a few years of very good hurling left in him, this might necessarily be the end of him in a Galway jersey. He could be convinced to come back. You, you have no idea. I mean, it's it's speculation and, and we love someone coming out of retirement. And sometimes that goes really well and sometimes it absolutely doesn't uh, for people. So it, it it will depend on so many factors. It will be depend on on who's involved with Galway and, and if he is playing with his club and maybe he, his injuries do do clear up. I mean, ripping your hamstring off the bone, I know it was in 2016, that, that, that's a seriously significant injury and something you're always keeping uh, keeping your eye on. And maybe if, if you're somebody of that level who loves playing and you spend more time minding yourself than actually playing the game, maybe that gets tiresome too. You can't just go out and with free abandon play the game. You're always wondering, am I going to get another bang here? Am I going to rip the other hamstring off the bone or, or what's going to happen? So, so maybe a little bit of, um, I, I suppose, rest from that sort of worry or tension. Um, who, who knows what might happen if, if he if he give, gets his body in a better position. And some of that consideration has to come into as well, Cleena, about where the team is at too. Like Galway mm. are probably going into a rebuild now at this stage, that team of 2017. There's quite a few of those players who are now either going into their 30s or are coming up to 30 years of age. There's a feeling that maybe they might have to recycle. If you're Joe Canning, you're, it's probably a different decision if you're maybe where Limerick are currently 
and you know that there's medals potentially there for the winning over the next couple of seasons, it's potentially easier to keep going than if you know. I think about Lionel Messi at the moment, even at Barcelona, whether you know when he wanted to leave last year, a large part of it was that he knew his team weren't going to be competing and he knew that the time was running out in his career. Every team goes through a cycle um, of, of dominance and, and then chasing and rebuilding and being at the top and, and that, that coincides with managers arriving and leaving. Um, and that can have, a, have an effect on players. That there's a natural end sometimes to a cycle with a team. And, and sometimes they're, they're that ha- even players that have a few more years in them, and I'm not saying this is why Joe was retiring, but in a general perspective, even if you have a few more years, it may, maybe the time is right anyway. Maybe you could play, if you, but whatever is happening within the team, it fits now because there's a rebuilding starting and maybe you're coming towards the end. So the, there, there is a lot in it. And the, the cycle of the team that you're in does play a part, I think, for a lot of people. Mm. This, this happens, Keane. I was just thinking in terms of rugby too, where, you know, Brian O'Driscoll said to us previously that he had decided, a bit like Joe Canning, a long way out that he was going to retire. It was never a snap decision right at the end. He said, right, this is one more season that I'm going to give. Those decisions are often so determined by landmarks within players' careers too. Like I'm thinking of Jonathan Sexton here, where, you know, Sexton has had a lot of injuries along the way, a lot of concussions along the way, plenty of people, a bit like Canning, talking about whether he should retire or not. But someone like Sexton, someone like Canning, they probably know their own body and where they're actually at, whether they can actually soldier on for longer or not. Yeah, spot on. And like... I hate the sort of the conversation, particularly around Johnny Sexton, you know, when people, you know, it happened in the build up to the France game this year, you know, when French doctors start talking about a guy's health when, number one, it's really none of our business. And number two, we have no idea, you know, and we should stay out of that. So I hate when people like speculate on should this guy retire, like these, these guys and girls know when the time is right to retire from them. Just a point to clean I made, you know, you talk about ripping the hamstring off the bone, like, I mean, that's an injury that finished Paul O'Connell's career and cost him a season in Toulon at the tail end of it when he picked it up at the 2015 World Cup. And I, I think I'm a bit guilty at times of this as well, you know, and when you get a press release and you see, oh, X player has picked up, you know, a torn hamstring or whatever, like, unless you've actually experienced that and touch, touch wood, I actually haven't. So I don't think you have an appreciation for how serious these injuries are, how long it takes to get back from them. And if you get ever get back to, to to your full fitness, if you're a professional rugby player, professional soccer player, you're obviously going to be able to do it quicker, probably because of the the resources you have around and the time. Like someone like Joe Canning has gone through all these injuries and is trying to live his life outside of it as well. Like he's not in a bubble where he can go in and spend morning, noon, and night with you know rehab and physios and, and things like that. So I think we probably don't have an appreciation for how much um, the injuries actually take a, a toll on these guys and girls' bodies. Yeah, it's very difficult. You're going to uh, clean it to Santry Sports Clinic and you go and have your operation. For most supporters, the next concern is when is player X available to play again? But ultimately, they may have to go through that pain and through that rehab at a time when they're juggling a full-time life and a full-time job along the way. And it's not like a professional athlete where they can be looked after within the club and actually take a genuine break. It's a huge thing that people don't see. And, and rehab is a torturous process for any athlete at the best of times. They're sports people. They want to play. They want to be on the pitch, the track, whatever it is. And now there's something wrong with their body. I mean, the, the body, their body is the thing that allows them to do it. And you've all this uncertainty and, and the timeline of an injury. All the sports scientists say, if, if you do X injury, this is the timeline. It'll be four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. You can go through, you can get to week three, something else happens, and then you're back to square one, or you can be just back solving one hamstring issue, and all of a sudden you've got an ankle thing because something else happens in the body. We forget, and because part of the, the language around sports sometimes is, you know, they're, they're a machine, he's a monster in the, in the rowing boat and all this, and the, the psychological prep and, and all of that, and, and the hardness around athletes sometimes. But the body is the body and the muscle is a muscle and sometimes they tear. And that, that rehab process is really, really difficult for athletes. And on the like on the, the point about retirement as well and timings of it, we see it with the, the hockey team now. There's a massive um, uh, chat around the retirement and how many of them are going to retire. And I think some of us, they, they've made no secret about it, some of the hockey players. I mean, some of them are getting their 200th cap and their 
their lifelong journey has been really to to get to the Olympics, which they they achieved, and fair play to them for that. But I think we 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 need to be careful that we don't retire some of them. We need to allow them time to reflect upon what they've done. They're they're very proud of of getting yeah. to the Olympics and and all of that. But but sometimes we we the public decide oh, well, this will be a right time for them to retire. But it's well, a very emotional decision. Unfortunately, the sands of time have beaten us in terms of the chat we have here. Many thanks to Clean and Keen for joining us on the paper review. Plenty of good reading to be had in the Sunday papers. And if you missed any of it, you can check it out on podcast. We'll be back with GA after the news. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Afternoons are-